The first question is to ensure that everyone understands what the symbols represent it is customary to include a a list b part number c legend d layer answer c legend explanation in technical drawings symbols are often used to represent various objects features or elements to avoid confusion and ensure clarity a legend is included a legend provides a key or explanation of the symbols used in the drawing making it easier for everyone to understand the representation tip when creating technical drawings always include a clear and comprehensive legend that explains the meaning of all the symbols used this will help readers interpret the drawing correctly moving on to the second question how many base units are in the international system of units a 3 b 4 c 5 d 7 answer d 7 explanation the international system of units c is based on seven base units which are used as the building blocks for measuring different physical quantities these base units include the meter length kilogram mass second time ampere electric current kelvin temperature mole amount of substance and candela luminous intensity tip remember the acronym mks ekamt to recall the names of the seven base units in the c system meter kilogram second ampere Kelvin, mole, and candela. Next up is question number three. Axonometric drawings are those drawings a in which the object is drawn in three dimensions, b which are used extensively in artistic drawing, c which has complete description of its shape, d all of the above. answer a in which the object is drawn in three dimensions explanation axonometric drawings are a type of technical drawing where the object is represented in three dimensions unlike traditional 2d drawings axonometric drawings show objects with all three dimensions visible and in proportion this allows for a more realistic representation of the object's shape and form tip think of axonometric as a combination of axial and metric axonometric drawings show objects in a metric three dimensional space along multiple axes let's move on to question number 4 which type of line is part of dimension in drawing a extension line b break line c phantom lines d cutting plane lines answer a extension line explanation in technical drawings dimension lines are used to indicate the size and measurements of various objects or features these dimension lines are accompanied by extension lines that extend from the object to the dimension line the extension lines help to clearly identify which object or feature the dimension refers to tip remember that extension lines extend from the object to the dimension line think of them as lines that extend the object's boundaries to the dimension moving on to question number 5 the arts of working the various sizes or measurements on finished drawing of an object is a measuring b lettering c scaling d dimensioning answer d dimensioning explanation dimensioning is the process of adding accurate measurements and sizes to a finished drawing of an object it involves placing dimension lines numerical values and other annotations that indicate the length width height 
or other relevant dimensions of the object. Tip, think of dimensioning as adding dimensions to a drawing. It is the final step that provides precise measurements and ensures the object can be accurately replicated. Next up is question number 6. Which of the following pencil leads is the hardest? A. B. B. H. C. 4 B. D. 4 H. Answer D. 4 H. Explanation Pencil leads are graded based on their hardness or softness. The H designation indicates harder leads, and the higher the number preceding the H, the harder the lead. Therefore, 4H is harder than B or H leads. Tip, remember that the H in pencil leads stands for hard. Higher numbers indicate harder leads, so 4H is harder than 2H and 2H is harder than H. Let's move on to question number 7. The brickwork is not measured in CUM in case of A. One or more than one brick wall. B. Brickwork in arches. C. Reinforced brickwork. D. Half brick wall. Answer D. Half brick wall. Explanation Brickwork is commonly measured in cubic meters to determine the quantity of bricks required for a construction project. However, in the case of a half brick wall, the measurements are typically specified in terms of the number of bricks used rather than cubic meters. This is because a half brick wall uses bricks in a specific pattern that is different from full brick walls. Tip, remember that for half brick walls, the measurement is based on the number of bricks used, not cubic meters. Moving on to question number 8. How many bags of cement in one metric tone? A. 5 B. 20 C. 50 D. 100 Answer B. 20 Explanation The weight of a bag of cement can vary depending on the country and manufacturer. However, a commonly used weight for a bag of cement is 50 kilograms. Therefore, in one metric tone, 1000 kilograms, there would be 20 bags of cement, 1000 kilograms, 50 kilograms is equal to 20 bags. Tip, remember that there are typically 20 bags of cement in one metric tone, assuming each bag weighs 50 kilograms. Next up is question number 9. The most reliable estimate for a building is A. Plinth area B. Cube rate C. Preliminary D. Detailed Answer D. Detailed Explanation When estimating the cost or other parameters of a building project, a detailed estimate is considered the most reliable. A detailed estimate involves a comprehensive analysis of the project's specifications, quantities, costs, and other factors. It provides a thorough and accurate assessment of the project's requirements and can be used as a basis for planning and budgeting. Tip, remember that a detailed estimate provides the most reliable and accurate assessment of a building project's requirements and costs. Let's move on to question number 10. The standard width of CGI sheet is A. 32 B. 36 C. 40 D. 45 Answer B. 36 Explanation CGI, corrugated galvanized iron, Sheets are commonly used in construction for roofing and cladding purposes. The standard width of a CGI sheet is typically 36 inches. Tip, remember that the standard width of a CGI sheet is 36 inches, which is equivalent to 3 feet. 
Moving on to question number 11. While estimating of a works the allowable contingency is A. 5% B. 4% C. 3% D. 2% Answer A. 5% Explanation Contingency refers to an amount set aside in the estimated cost of a project to account for unforeseen events or changes that may occur during construction. The allowable contingency is the percentage of the estimated cost that is allocated for such contingencies. In many cases, a common practice is to allocate a contingency of 5% of the estimated cost. Tip, remember that a common allowable contingency in estimating the cost of works is 5% of the estimated cost. Next up is question number 12. In case of discrepancy between rate in words and figures. A. Rate in words is determining. B. Rate in figures is determining. C. Both A and B. D. None of the above. Answer. A. Rate in words is determining. Explanation. In construction contracts and documents, rates are often mentioned both in words and figures to avoid any ambiguity or misinterpretation. In case of a discrepancy between the rate mentioned in words and figures, the rate mentioned in words is considered the determining factor. This is because written words are given higher importance and are considered the accurate representation of the intended rate. Tip, remember that in case of a discrepancy, the rate mentioned in words takes precedence over the rate mentioned in figures. Let's move on to question number 13. In leveling operation. A. When instrument is being shifted, staff must not be moved. B. When staff is being carried forward, instrument must remain stationary. C. Both A and B. D. None of the above. Answer. C. Both A and B. Explanation. Leveling is a surveying technique used to determine the elevations of different points on the ground. In leveling operations, it is essential to ensure accuracy and consistency. When the instrument is being shifted, the staff must not be moved and when the staff is being carried forward, the instrument must remain stationary. Both of these practices contribute to maintaining accuracy and consistency in leveling operations. Tip, remember that both practices mentioned in options A and B are important considerations in leveling operations to ensure accuracy. Moving on to question number 14. Leveling deals with the measurements in A. A. Horizontal plane. B. Inclined plane. C. Vertical plane. D. Both A and C. Answer. C. Vertical plane. Explanation. Leveling is primarily concerned with determining the elevations or heights of different points on the ground or various features of a structure. It focuses on the vertical component and deals with measurements in a vertical plane. Tip, remember that leveling is related to vertical measurements and works in a vertical plane. Next up is question number 15. Chain survey uses the principle of A. Traversing B. Chaining C. Ranging D. Triangulation Answer D. Triangulation Explanation Chain survey is a traditional method of surveying that involves measuring distances and angels using a chain or tape measure. Triangulation is a principle used in chain surveying, where triangles are formed using measured distances and angels. 
These triangles help in determining the positions of points and creating a network of survey control points. Tip, remember that chain surveying relies on the principle of triangulation to determine positions and create a network of control points. Let's move on to question number 16. Survey based on instrument use can be classified into A. Compass Survey B. Plane Table Survey C. Theodolite Survey D. All the above Answer D. All the above Explanation Surveys can be classified based on the instruments used for measurement. The options given in the question, Compass Survey, Plane Table Survey, and Theodolite Survey all represent different types of surveys based on the instrument used. Compass Survey involves using a compass for measuring angels, Plane Table Survey utilizes a plane table and Allidade for measurements, and Theodolite Survey employs a Theodolite for accurate angle and distance measurements. Therefore, all the options mentioned are correct classifications of surveys based on instrument use. Tip, remember that different survey techniques utilize different instruments and it's important to be familiar with the characteristics and applications of each type. Moving on to question number 17. The horizontal angle between the true meridian and magnetic bearing at a place in a compass survey is called a. Local Attraction B. Declination C. True Bearing D. All the above B. Declination Explanation In a compass survey, the magnetic needle of a compass points to the magnetic north, which is different from the true north. The horizontal angle between the true meridian geographic north and the magnetic bearing at a specific location is known as declination. Declination varies depending on the location and changes over time due to the movement of magnetic poles. Tip, remember that declination represents the angular difference between the true north and the magnetic north in a compass survey. Next up is question number 18. What does the abbreviation GPS stands for? A. Global Positioning System B. Global Point Selection C. Geographical Position System D. Geographical Point Software Answer A. Global Positioning System Explanation GPS stands for Global Positioning System it is a satellite-based navigation system that provides precise location information, time, and velocity to GPS receivers. GPS technology is widely used in various applications, including navigation, surveying, mapping, and tracking. Tip, remember that GPS stands for Global Positioning System, which is a satellite-based navigation system. Let's move on to question number 19. Sandstone is A. Sedimentary rock B. Metamorphic rock C. Igneous rock D. Volcanic rock A. Sedimentary rock Explanation Sandstone is a type of sedimentary rock. It is composed of sand-sized grains of minerals, rock fragments, and organic material that are compacted and cemented together over time. Sandstone is commonly used in construction and as a decorative material due to its durability and unique texture. Tip, remember that sandstone belongs to the category of sedimentary rocks formed from the accumulation and consolidation of sand particles. Moving on to question number 20. OPC cement stands for A. Optimum Portland Cement B. Ordinary Portland Cement C. One-Time Portland Cement D. None of the above
आंसर बी ऑर्डिनरी पोर्टलैंड सीमेंट एक्सप्लेनेशन ओपीसी सीमेंट स्टैंड्स फॉर ऑर्डिनरी पोर्टलैंड सीमेंट इट इज द मोस्ट कॉमनली यूज टाइप ऑफ सीमेंट इन कंस्ट्रक्शन ओपीसी सीमेंट इज नोन फॉर इट्स स्ट्रेंथ ड्यूरेबिलिटी एंड वर्सिटिलिटी एंड इट इज वाइडली यूज इन वेरियस कॉन्क्रीट एप्लीकेशन इंक्लूडिंग बिल्डिंग फाउंडेशन स्ट्रक्चर्स एंड पेवमेंट्स टिप रिमेंबर दैट ओपीसी सीमेंट इज एन अब्रीविएशन फॉर ऑर्डिनरी पोर्टलैंड सीमेंट विच इज अ वाइडली यूज टाइप ऑफ सीमेंट इन कंस्ट्रक्शन लेट्स मूव ऑन टू क्वेश्चन नंबर ट्वेंटी टू सीजनिंग ऑफ टिम्बर इज डन टू ए मेक इट वॉटर प्रूफ बी पेंट इट्स सर्फिस सी इंक्रीज इट्स टेम्परेचर D. Remove water. Answer: D. Remove water. Explanation: Seasoning of timber refers to the process of reducing the moisture content in timber before using it in construction. The main objective of seasoning is to remove water from the timber, which helps prevent shrinkage, warping, and decay. Seasoned timber is more stable and suitable for various applications in construction. Tip: Remember that seasoning of timber involves the removal of water to enhance its stability and durability. Moving on to question number 23. Inner part of timber log surrounding the pitch is called A sapwood. B cambium layer. C heartwood. D none of these. Answer C heartwood Explanation The heartwood is the inner darker colored part of a timber log that surrounds the pitch or sapwood It is the older non-living portion of the tree trunk that provides strength and durability to the timber Heartwood is typically more resistant to decay and insect attacks compared to sapwood Tip remember that heartwood is the inner part of timber that surrounds the sapwood and is known for its strength and resistance to decay. Next up is question number 24. Which of the following is an alloy of copper? A white alien. B brass. C inver. D plain lime. Answer B brass Explanation brass is an alloy made by combining copper and zinc It is a widely used alloy known for its corrosion resistance malleability and attractive golden appearance Brass is commonly used in plumbing fittings musical instruments decorative items and electrical components Tip remember that brass is an alloy of copper and zinc commonly used in various applications let's move on to question number 25 lime mortar is generally made with a quick lime b fat lime c hydraulic lime d plain lime answer c hydraulic lime explanation Lime mortar is a type of mortar used in masonry construction. It is made by mixing lime, aggregates and water. Hydraulic lime is a specific type of lime that possesses hydraulic properties, meaning it can set and harden even when exposed to water. Hydraulic lime is commonly used in lime mortar to provide strength and durability. Tip remember that lime mortar is generally made with hydraulic lime which allows it to set and harden in the presence of water Moving on to question number 26 Marble is more susceptible to A alkaline B water C acids D all the above Answer C acids Explanation Marble is a metamorphic rock commonly used in construction and for decorative purposes However it is more susceptible to acids compared to other substances 
Acidic substances can cause etching and discoloration on the surface of marble, which can diminish its appearance and integrity. It is important to take precautions and avoid contact with acidic solutions when dealing with marble surfaces. Tip, remember that marble is sensitive to acids and should be protected from exposure to acidic substances. Next up is question number 27. The building should be In countries like Nepal A. Earthquake proof B. Earthquake resistance C. 13 Richter resistance D. 8 Richter scale proof Answer B. Earthquake resistance Explanation In countries prone to seismic activity like Nepal it is crucial for buildings to be designed and constructed to be earthquake resistant. This means implementing structural elements and engineering techniques that can withstand the forces generated during an earthquake. Building codes and regulations in such areas often have specific requirements to ensure the safety and resilience of structures against seismic events. Tip, remember that buildings in earthquake-prone regions should be designed and constructed to be earthquake-resistant for the safety of occupants. Let's move on to question number 28. The slump test is done to measure of concrete A. Workability B. Bearing capacity C. Shear D. Compression Answer A. Workability Explanation The slump test is a common method used to assess the workability of freshly mixed concrete. It involves measuring the slump or settlement of a concrete cone when it is placed and then removed. The slump value provides an indication of the consistency and flowability of the concrete mix, which is important for proper placement and compaction during construction. Tip, remember that the slump test is conducted to determine the workability of concrete by measuring its slump or settlement. Moving on to question number 29. The temporary work erected to support a number of platforms at a different levels for the convenience of the workers is known as A. Shoring B. Underpinning C. Scaffolding D. Foamworks Answer C. Scaffolding Explanation Scaffolding is a temporary structure erected at construction sites to provide a safe and stable platform for workers to perform tasks at different heights. It consists of various components, such as tubes, couplers, boards and ladders, assembled in a specific configuration to create a stable working platform. Scaffolding ensures the safety and accessibility of workers during construction or maintenance activities. Tip, remember that scaffolding is used as temporary support to provide convenient working platforms at different heights during construction. Next up is question number 30. Admixture in cement concrete are used for A. Water reduction in the mix B. Set acceleration C. Strength enhancement D. All the above Answer D. All the above Explanation Admixtures are substances added to cement concrete during the mixing process to modify its properties. They can serve multiple purposes including reducing the water content of the mix, water reduction, accelerating the setting and hardening process, set acceleration, and improving the strength and durability of the hardened concrete, strength enhancement. Admixtures offer flexibility and control over concrete characteristics, allowing for better performance in various construction applications. Tip, remember that admixtures in cement concrete can serve different purposes, including water reduction, set acceleration, and strength enhancement. 
Let's move on to question number 31. The vertical members fixed between steps and handrail are known as A. Balusters B. Strings C. Newell posts D. Soffits Answer A. Balusters Explanation Balusters are vertical or slanted members that are placed between the steps and handrail of a staircase or balcony. They provide support and safety by acting as a barrier and preventing people from falling off the edge. Balusters can be made of various materials such as wood, metal or glass and they come in different designs and styles, adding aesthetic appeal to the overall structure. Tip, remember that balusters are the vertical members that provide support and safety between steps and handrails in a staircase or balcony. Moving on to question number 32. A horizontal bar chart that shows project tasks against a calendar is called A. Milestone B. Goal C. Gantt chart D. Pert chart Answer C. Gantt chart Explanation A Gantt chart is a visual representation of project tasks displayed in a horizontal bar chart format. It shows the start and end dates of each task along a calendar timeline, allowing project managers to plan, schedule and track progress effectively. Gantt charts provide a clear overview of task dependencies, durations, and milestones, aiding in project management and coordination. Tip, remember that a Gantt chart is a horizontal bar chart used to depict project tasks against a calendar timeline. Next up is question number 33. The type of pointing in which upper side of mortar joints is kept about 12 mm inside the face of masonry and bottom is kept flushed with face of the wall is. A. Truck pointing B. Resist pointing C. Struck pointing D. Grooved pointing Answer C. Struck pointing Explanation Struck pointing is a type of pointing technique used in masonry construction. It involves shaping the mortar joints between bricks or stones in such a way that the upper side of the joint is set back about 12 mm from the face of the masonry, creating a slightly recessed appearance. The bottom side of the joint is leveled or flushed with the surface of the wall, providing a neat and uniform finish. Tip, remember that struck pointing is a pointing method where the upper side of mortar joints is set back while the bottom side is flushed with the wall's face. Let's move on to question number 34. The first step in flooring is A. Topping B. RCC layer C. Sand filling D. Base coat Answer D. Base Coat Explanation When installing a flooring system, the base coat is typically the first step. The base coat serves as a foundation and provides a level surface for subsequent layers of flooring materials, such as tiles, wood or concrete toppings. It is applied directly onto the prepared subfloor and may consist of materials like mortar, self-leveling compounds, or primers, depending on the specific flooring system being installed. Tip, remember that the base coat is the initial layer applied during flooring installation to create a smooth and level surface for subsequent flooring materials. Moving on to question number 35. A standard rule of thumb is that sewer pipes leading away from a toilet are Inches is diameter a. 1.5 B. 2 C. 3 D. 6 Answer D. 6 
explanation, when it comes to sewer pipes leading away from a toilet, a commonly followed rule of thumb is to use pipes with a diameter of 6 inches. This larger pipe size helps accommodate the flow and volume of waste and prevents clogs and blockages. However, specific requirements may vary depending on local plumbing codes and the design of the sewage system. Tip, remember that sewer pipes leading away from a toilet are typically 6 inches in diameter as a general guideline. Next up is question number 36. The diameter of opening of overhead water storage circular tank in a building shall be not less than a. 300 mm b. 450 mm c. 600 mm D. 750 mm Answer P. 450 mm Explanation The diameter of the opening of an overhead water storage circular tank in a building refers to the size of the axis or inlet through which water is filled or emptied. It is important to have an adequate diameter to ensure smooth water flow and ease of maintenance. The minimum recommended diameter for such an opening is 450 mm, providing sufficient space for effective water management. Tip, remember that the minimum diameter of the opening of an overhead water storage circular tank in a building should be 450 mm for optimal functionality. Let's move on to question number 37. The earthing is an important component of electric system that A. Prevents damage to electric appliances B. Prevents electric shocks C. Prevents risk of fire D. All of above Answer D. All of the above Explanation, earthing, also known as grounding, is a vital safety measure in electrical systems. It involves connecting electrical equipment and conductive parts to the ground or earth. The primary purposes of earthing are to protect appliances and electrical systems from damage due to electrical faults, prevent electric shocks to individuals, and minimize the risk of fire caused by electrical malfunctions. By providing a low-resistance path for fault currents, earthing helps ensure safety and operational reliability. Tip, remember that earthing serves multiple purposes, including protecting appliances, preventing electric shocks, and reducing the risk of fire in electrical systems. Moving on to question number 38. Per capita demand of water is calculated in liters. A. Per person per day B. Per person per month C. Per person per year D. None of the above Answer A. Per person per day Explanation Per capita demand for water refers to the average water consumption required by an individual on a daily basis. It is calculated in liters per person per day, LPCD. This measure is used in water supply planning and management to estimate the quantity of water needed to meet the basic needs of a population, including drinking, cooking, sanitation, and hygiene. Tip, remember that per capita demand for water is expressed in liters per person per day, LPCD, as a measure of average daily water consumption. Next up is question number 39. The road pavement structure layers is R as A. Subgrade B. Base cores C. Surface cores or wearing cores D. All of the above Answer D. All of the above Explanation the road pavement structure consists of multiple layers designed to provide stability, strength, and a smooth driving surface. The key components of a road pavement structure are as follows. 
subgrade, the natural soil or prepared surface on which the road is constructed. Base course, a layer of granular material placed on the subgrade to provide additional support and distribute loads. Surface course or wearing course, the topmost layer of the road, typically consisting of asphalt or concrete, which provides the smooth driving surface and protects underlying layers. Tip, remember that the road pavement structure includes the subgrade, base course, and surface course, wearing course, as essential layers for road construction. Let's move on to question number 40. The methods of irrigation is are A. Surface irrigation B. Sprinkler irrigation C. Drip irrigation D. All of the above Irrigation is the process of supplying water to agricultural fields or gardens to ensure the proper growth and development of plants. Various methods of irrigation are employed based on the water source, crop requirements and efficiency of water distribution. The three common methods of irrigation are surface irrigation, sprinkler irrigation, drip irrigation. Tip, remember that there are different methods of irrigation, including surface irrigation, sprinkler irrigation and drip irrigation, each with its own advantages and suitable applications. Next up is question number 42. What type of irrigation method is also called as trickle irrigation? A. Sprinkler irrigation method B. Furrow irrigation method C. Drip irrigation method D. Check flooding Answer C. Drip irrigation method Explanation Drip irrigation is a method of providing water to plants by applying it slowly and directly to the plant root zone through a network of tubes or pipes with emitters. It is called drip irrigation because water drips or trickles out of the emitters and is delivered in small, precise quantities to the plants. This method ensures efficient water use, reduces evaporation, and minimizes water loss due to runoff or deep percolation. Tip, remember that drip irrigation is commonly referred to as trickle irrigation due to the slow and controlled release of water directly to the plant roots. Let's move on to question number 43. The process of passing water through beds of granular materials is called A. Screening B. Sedimentation C. Filtration D. None of the above Answer, C. Filtration Explanation, filtration is a process used to separate solids or impurities from a fluid, usually water, by passing it through a porous medium or filter bed. In the context of water treatment or purification, filtration involves passing water through beds of granular materials, such as sand or activated carbon, to remove suspended particles, sediment, or other contaminants. This process helps improve the quality and clarity of water before it is used for various purposes. Tip, remember that filtration is the process of passing water through beds of granular materials to remove impurities or contaminants. Moving on to question number 44. For the self-cleaning of side drain, the minimum gradient required is a. 1% B. 1.5% C. 1.5% D. 2% Answer C. 1.5% Explanation A side drain is a channel or conduit constructed alongside a road or embankment to collect and convey surface water runoff. To ensure proper drainage and self-cleaning of the side drain, it needs to have a minimum gradient or slope. In this case, 
The minimum gradient required is half a percent, which means that for every 100 units of horizontal distance, the drain should have a vertical drop of half a unit. This slope allows the water to flow efficiently, preventing the accumulation of debris or sediment and maintaining the drain's self-cleaning capacity. Tip, remember that a minimum gradient of half a percent is required for the self-cleaning of a side drain. Next up is question number 45. Which is the factor affecting the selection of water source for drinking water? A. Quantity of water B. Quality of water C. Location of water resources D. All of the above Answer D. All of the above Explanation When selecting a water source for drinking water supply, several factors need to be considered to ensure a safe and reliable water source. These factors include Quantity of water Sufficient quantity of water should be available to meet the drinking water demands of the population. The source should have an adequate supply of water to sustain the needs of the community. Considering all these factors is important to ensure a safe and sustainable drinking water supply for the community. Tip, remember that the selection of a water source for drinking water is influenced by factors such as quantity, quality, and location of water resources. Let's move on to question number 46. Water supply system includes A. Construction of dams B. Entire arrangement from source to distribution C. Construction of canals D. Digging a well for water Answer, B. Entire arrangement from source to distribution. Explanation, the water supply system encompasses all the components and processes involved in delivering water from its source to the end users. It includes various stages and infrastructure required for the treatment, storage, transmission and distribution of water. The components of a water supply system typically include water source, treatment facilities, storage, transmission, distribution network, consumer connections. The water supply system is designed to ensure the availability of safe and potable water to meet the needs of the population it serves. Tip, remember that the water supply system involves the entire arrangement, including the water source, treatment, storage, transmission, and distribution to end users. Moving on to question number 47. Which type of canal is best suitable to avoid cross-drainage in canal alignment? A. Ridge Canal B. Contour Canal C. Side Slope Canal D. None of the above Answer C. Side Slope Canal Explanation Cross-drainage refers to the passage of a canal across natural or man-made obstacles such as rivers, streams, or roads. The selection of a suitable canal alignment is crucial to avoid the need for constructing expensive structures like bridges or culverts for cross-drainage. Among the given options, a side-slope canal is the best choice for this purpose. Tip, remember that a side-slope canal is the most suitable type of canal alignment to avoid cross-drainage as it follows the natural slope of the land and reduces the need for additional structures. Next up is question number 48. The Local Government Operation Act 2074 BS came into effect since A. September 2017 B. October 2017 C. November 2017 D. December 2017 Answer. B. October 2017 Explanation. In the context of the given question, the Local Government Operation Act 
2074 BS came into effect in October 2017. This means that from October 2017 onwards, the provisions and regulations outlined in the Act became applicable, guiding the functioning of local governments at various levels, such as municipalities and rural municipalities, in Nepal. Tip, remember that the Local Government Operation Act, 2074 BS became effective in October 2017, regulating the operation of local governments in Nepal. Let's move on to question number 49. As per Article 38, 1 of Local Government Operation Act, 2074 a person or a government entity has to complete the construction of building within. From the date of permission to construct. A. 1 year B. 2 year C. 3 year D. 4 year Answer B. 2 years Explanation Article 38 1 of the Local Government Operation Act 2074 BS outlines the time limit for completing the construction of a building after obtaining permission to construct. According to this provision, a person or a government entity is required to complete the construction within two years from the date of receiving the permission. Tip, remember that as per Article 38, 1 of the Local Government Operation Act, 2074 BS, the construction of a building must be completed within two years from the date of obtaining permission. Moving on to last question. According to the Constitution of Nepal, the list of local level power have been provisioned in A. Schedule 6 B. Schedule 8 C. Schedule 7 D. Schedule 9 Answer B. Schedule 8 Explanation In this context, the list of local level powers is provisioned in Schedule 8 of the Constitution of Nepal. Schedule 8 enumerates the exclusive, concurrent, and residual powers of the local levels. It specifies the areas in which the local governments have authority to make decisions and take actions within their jurisdictions. Tip, remember that the list of local level powers is provisioned in Schedule 8 of the Constitution of Nepal, which outlines the exclusive, concurrent, and residual powers of the local governments. Go.